with people who were protesting institutional racism and police violence, but also go learn what I could do. And when I drove to Ferguson the first time, I intentionally left my camera at home. And I had this sense that I did not want to take pretty pictures. And I needed to engage. And throughout the course of that engagement, the friendship building, I was asked by some activists to take photographs of other activists. And I said I, 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 I would be very honored to take those portraits that I know these people and, and the work that they're doing. <clears throat> and so we arranged that. And there was a huge political undercurrent to taking these photos, right? Because you're taking photos of black activists that you know as a white person, a lot of people can see through many different lenses. Do they see them as scary? Do they see them as violent? Do they see them as angry? Or will they see them as people? And how do I work with them to capture what the many parts of their soul is as a human? And I don't know, even though I had that instinct to not bring my camera the first time, I don't know that I would have understood all the nuances of how to approach that photography if I hadn't been open and listening to the black activists that were around me and understanding their perspective, why they were there, why this moment was so important to them, what the changes were that needed to occur and where they came from. So for me, the political is super important but it doesn't disconnect from the personal. The political is the personal. And sometimes the most political act that we can have in our art is trying to understand our subject and then use that deeper understanding to communicate. Um, you know, um, so fashion is, uh, is a tricky, stupid business in a lot of ways, and it makes me a little angry sometimes when I have a client that, I, that comes in and, you know, she's beautiful, and she'll say, oh, my arms, or, uh, or um, there's, you could just go, like, look anywhere, and you'll see that it's mostly a bunch of skinny white women and that are young, too young to afford the dresses that they're wearing. So it's stupid. It's really silly. But it's driven to, you know, sell things. So, I mean, to echo what Attilio was saying, I mean, we live in St. Louis. It's charged here. And I think it's been really important for me just to listen to people, to, to, to hear what they're saying. Um, whether it's, um, you know, I don't feel uh, uh, sexy anymore, or whether it's the people are, of color aren't represented. Um, it's, it's tricky, and, and, I, and so I tend to just listen. Um, but I have Personally, on my, in my brand and in my social media, I don't shy away from how I feel. And um, I'm not afraid. I've lost all those great clients in Texas. It's true, they're all gone. But um, <laughs> all their oil money. But uh, I don't need them. So uh, I mean, that's not what my brand is about. It's coming from my heart. So, um, you know, I think that I've made sure that I've. The, the people in my campaign now are, you know, there's women over 50 wearing my clothes on my website and they look awesome and I think that sends a really cool message. Um, uh, I, 
I definitely uh, use people of color because um, it, it's, it's, it's like a rainbow, you know? Where, where did Benetton go? <laughs> they were the best. But, um, but yeah, so I mean, I think that, that, that as a brand, I'm trying to listen and I think that's the best I can do. That's definitely um, a question that I've been given a lot of thoughts like over the years, especially given all the activities here in St. Louis. Um, like most typically politics and things like that, um, I kept out of my blog. But um, as I'm thinking about that more, finding and thinking about ways rather to incorporate social issues more, even just today, actually later this afternoon, on my site I'm launching a collaborative project with a group of bloggers all across the country. And all we're doing is we're using our fashion platforms to raise awareness about black lives, right? So it's, we're going to be using the hashtag bloggers for black lives. And um, the way we're, we're, I'm approaching it rather is often you, you're told that fashion and your style is a way to speak to the world without even saying a word. So we're kind of uniting to do just that by wearing all black and kind of rallying behind this hashtag just to say, hey, we're aware of the violence against African Americans, particularly black males, especially here in St. Louis, and we really want to push for social justice. And we're just using our platforms to kind of raise awareness about that. But like I said, I mean, it's such a kind of big, there's so many major kind of social issues, and that's something I'm just continuing to give a lot of thought. Yeah, for, uh, for me, it's, a, you know, it's interesting. Um, growing up here and interacting with you know, a lot of the things St. Louis has become known for and the ways there's, the, you know, the things that are broken here, but then also the ways we've grown as a city, is, it's been amazing to see. And then it's been interesting to enter into that as a business owner over the past few years. Um, personally, we don't do a lot of stuff on social media in, re in regard to the issues. And that's more of uh, in regard to just, I feel like on social media, sometimes it can be a slippery slope. And for personally, it's like, I like to have the conversation in person. And we invite that dialogue when at our business. And so we hope that our business and the space we're in is a safe space for people to have conversations to, that they feel that they're treated with dignity and respect no matter who they are. And that it's a place that's welcoming to them and they'll feel loved. And that's, you know, essentially how we try to live that out, you know, for East and West. And, Personally, how I do it, um, you know, it, for me, it's it, it tends to the bridges I build or whatever you might call that. It, it always happens from personal relationships and having conversations and sitting down with folks, and I try to, you know, let that um, grow into my business as well. So, yeah, I guess uh, I can look at this a couple different ways. I go that as a brand owner, it is a slippery slope to, you know, say to interject what's happening on a social level for a brand that sells bottle openers. Uh, the, there's kind of a disconnect and it's kind of like, what's your, why do you even have a perspective on this? Just shut up and be happy and represent positivity. Uh, and also with client work, you're not gonna be able to interject your thoughts on government surveillance or you know, other bullshit politics that you don't agree with into a logo for a uh, healthcare entity. Um, so it's just, you know, there isn't really that pressing need to have a discourse on everything that you do. But at the end of the day, I think that if you don't start to form a strong opinion about things in this world and you just do work, uh, then you're really kind of not becoming a contributing member of society. You know, it's, we're lucky to live in a country where we can share our opinion very freely without any harm, uh, for the most part, <laughs> uh, being brought to you. Um, and I think that that's something that we overlook pretty frequently. Um, and I think the older you get, I feel that I've been more of a position of watching and listening to people and trying to come up with an articulate and intelligent uh, point of view for these things. So I feel like I'm just now getting into the frame of mind of being able to discuss these things and how they relate to me on a creative level. Um, so as a photographer, I actually was motivated to go to Ferguson, not as an opportunist, but I felt that um, 
I needed to document what was going on uh, for myself as a way to process and then for others eventually to look at what was happening. Uh, so I didn't really, I actually waited a year before I ever put out any of the photos that I took because I didn't want to be seen as like, yo, check out my dope photos of protesters getting uh, tear gassed or anything like that, which there was unfortunately quite a bit of um, people trying to make a name for themselves with news platforms uh, and saying, yeah, use my photos, give me some, give me some shine. Uh, but I just wanted to go to process through my lens because I didn't, I didn't feel the draw that Atelier did to uh, protest or stand or, or, or be involved um, uh, emotionally and, 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 and spirit with uh, the people that were making their voice heard. Um, so I think there's two, I, I'm kind of trailing off, but like I feel like that there's two different perspectives to be had um, from that situation. Um, and yes, that's all I have to say on that matter. So for one of our last questions, um, well, we'll do one of our last questions, and then I want to get some questions from you guys, if you have any, for the panel today. We've talked about a ton of different perspectives that we have of our city, and then we've talked about perspectives that other people have of our city. And we all know, living here, that those can be so vastly different. So there's stereotypes of us as a flyover state with a suffering farmer in the field. We have stereotypes of St. Louis City when we talk to our friends in different states about it being incredibly dangerous and the protests. Those are such different looks. We have people who come here from New York, like Brian was saying, and they're like, oh, this is kind of like New York. Well, I'd love to know, in five years, what do you want people to think of St. Louis as you're working and living here and staying here? What would you love people to think when they came to St. Louis in the next five years? And when, you know, are they comparing us to someone else? And if not, what are they saying about us? I mean, I guess I've always told people, St. Louis is a great place to live, but it's hard to visit. And I think that's kind of changing, actually, um, with all the redevelopment in the startup community and the companies that are focusing here, along with the uh, civic development of the arch grounds and the renewed focus on St. Louis downtown. I think that that's very important. Um, I myself am trying to figure out ways to be involved more downtown because I do think that it's the heart of the city and it all radiates out from there. Um, and I would hope that in five years, it's not that we're in the headlines every day, but when people come here, it's easy for them to see why St. Louis is such a great city and to almost feel like that they've uncovered something. You know, like, oh, I've heard about St. Louis because it's dangerous and because of Ferguson, but it's a pretty fucking awesome place to go just because there's so much to do. There's all these incredible neighborhoods. It's not expensive, you have all these free attractions, and I just didn't know. Like, I, I like that because I, I like the whole underdog mentality. I don't like to just, you know, broadcast to the entire world that St. Louis is awesome because then everybody will move here and it'll get expensive like every other place. <laughs> so I, I like to retain that kind of like mystique and mysterious aspect of St. Louis and then pleasantly surprise people that come here uh, when they get here. Yeah, I would uh, say, you know, one of the things I always love to brag on in St. Louis is that when people come to visit, one of the things they typically are always shocked is like how good like our restaurants are and things like that. And it was funny, last, um, last fall I had one of my brands visited and there were two owners, one's from Los Angeles, one's from New York, so two of the foodie capitals of the world, you could say. And I was taking them around all my favorite spots. And so we did Bogarts and we did, you know, a bunch of different places. And they were just like blown away that like food this good existed in St. Louis, which is, you know, to us, that's we're, we're used to that now. And to me, that's like one little kernel, like a sense of pride of even looking back five years to see how much we've grown that, you know, for all the places I've traveled, I think like our dining scene competes with anybody. Maybe we don't have as many amazing French restaurants is New York, but man, we got a couple really good ones, or you know, something to that extent. And so I'd love to see that grow outside of that over the next five years, um, in terms of all the diff other different cultural communities um, kind of progressing. 
And then the big thing that Kevin kind of touched on that I'd love to see is just seeing like downtown and the city of St. Louis like really starting to build bridges between all the different communities, not just like racially, but also just like from a transportation perspective and building more bike lanes and making it more commuter friendly and, um, you know, making it a more desirable place for people to move into because I think, you know, the more people that do move into the community and are part of the fabric of it, the better the communities will continue to be, whatever they, you know, whatever the people look like, people that are invested will make communities better. And I hope that that's where we see a lot of progress over the next five years. Um, just because, you know, I live in Tower Grove neighborhood and I, we love our community. Now, I would say now it doesn't always bridge with all the other ones, but it'd be amazing if it started to. And like, you know, I look at like the Cortex district and everything that's happening and you see everything in the Grove and it's like, wouldn't it be amazing if all these things just started to connect together like you see in other cities and there's bike lanes in between all of them and there's like a lot of policies that go in that improve people's quality of living even more so than right now. So those those in between neighborhoods are really like like where Olio is yeah. and Southern Loafers because it's kind of like you have Shaw and Tower Grove and then all of a sudden it's connecting to the Grove through that one street, basically. I love the in between neighborhoods. Anything that can continue to flourish in those that will connect the community. Yeah. So. I think that those ideas of connection are super important, definitely I think that is a huge disadvantage in our city is public transportation access and for it, and also bike bike uh, access. I think that all these things that we will do. So, so one of the patterns in American cities, as they have they go through a renaissance, has been that some people benefit and some people get excluded, and. The people on the lower socioeconomic rungs of the ladder and people of color and black people in particular in our cities tend to be excluded from these renaissances. And so when we talk about a neighborhood becoming a great neighborhood, and oftentimes there were people there before, but then when we move in and make that a quote unquote great neighborhood, who's it a great neighborhood for? And did everybody benefit from that? So in other words, if we turn Shaw and Cherokee Street into a Chesterfield suburb, but the people who lived there before go move on to another neighborhood that they still struggle to find jobs and still deal with all the cultural factors that lead to being in a more violent, uh, insecure place, have we really accomplished anything? So what I would like to see St. Louis become in the next 5, 10, 15 years is a model of a city that succeeds by including all of its people in that success, where we all focus on that. There's so many levels of inclusion. It is how do we put the pressure on our leaders that when they're encouraging development, they're encouraging mixed-use development so that it's not just these urban neighborhoods becoming high-priced neighborhoods, but they're neighborhoods that people who haven't had economic opportunity uh, in the past can continue to live in and get jobs in. There are neighborhoods that artists can still afford to live in and create. Um, and then it's also in the way that we uh, include everybody in who we represent. So whether we are a magazine, like myself, who we own, who do we represent in our publication? Uh, what artists are we looking at and showing to the community? Um, what, what business owners? But then also as designers and creatives, who are we including in the work we do and the targeting? So I think that for me, that will be success. If we can become a model of a city that grows while including everybody in our city and thinking about who that is and creating a city of equal opportunity, that would be success for me versus San Francisco where you have just the property values go up and the only ones who benefit are people who have uh, the great tech jobs in the city and the rest of the city is left behind. So really, did the city benefit? Did the city really improve? 
or just some of the people in the city did. You are a treasure. <laughs> Seriously, I love you, Italio. Uh, you're the best. Um, I'm not going to be able to even at so everything that you just said, 100%. And um, as a person who grew up here uh, and uh, fairly early knew that I was not going to be able to play soccer at, at Catholic school or whatever, um, I, I, this city for me was the place I needed to leave immediately because I was, I'm not safe here, my purse falls out of my mouth when I talk. This is not good. So um, it was very hard for me to leave San Francisco. But when I did, um, I noticed that there was changes emerging, and uh, I've been watching. These changes are, are like the cortex, and, and even before that, little things, little little hints that, that people were interested in fashion, and, 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 and it keeps getting better and better and better and better and better, and I'm like, buy your property now. So, um, and I'm excited to see where that goes. And as a, as a designer here, with a community of already existing designers, I think when they brought in these new designers, watch out, it's gonna be amazing. So, so that's very exciting. Um, and just everything, it, it, the innovation, the design community, um, in, in five years, I, I, I can't even imagine. At the speed that we're going, it's, it's going to be great, but we do need more public transit, because, <laughs> come on. Yeah. <laughs> well, when I think of sort of the future of St. Louis, I see um, serious possibility. Uh, right now, I think everyone knows that St. Louis is a very segregated city, and at times, unfortunately, my fashion worlds reflect that kind of segregation and separation. I participate and I'm called on a lot to uh, represent at events that are predominantly white. And at the same time, I attend a number of events that are predominantly black, right? Very rarely is there ever a solid mix at the, in the community that I participate in as it relates to fashion. And I do find that troubling. So I feel like whenever I'm given the chance or the opportunity, like I worked with a major national brand recently that has a branch here to host an event that brought influences together. And by the time I had my whole guest list together, we looked like the United Colors of Benetton. Because from what I've seen in my experience, diversity and achieving or increasing or supporting diversity always has to be intentional. You need to have somebody on your team who says, this is what this thing is going to have to look like because it's not going to happen by accident. That red book cover I got to be on, there were six women. Three of them were plus size, that was not an accident. Three of us were black women, that was not an accident. One of those black women had kinky natural hair, and that was not an accident, right? And that was not an accident because somebody on that team said, this is a real women style of wise competition, and we need this cover to represent real women across this country. So diversity has to be intentional. And I feel like um, we need it, because diversity is important, because true innovation Real innovation, real development can't occur without it. It's tricky sometimes, right? I'm in a lot of situations and uh, in my black communities, we can talk about uh, major social issues that affect us very comfortably. In my white communities, we don't talk about that and I understand how that can sometimes be difficult. A person might not want to say the wrong thing, but we've got to increase this conversation because there's not enough of it. We've got to plan and we've got to work on implementing uh, this kind of diversity because to be a truly innovative city, we can't do that if we just come, have homogenous people making all the decisions and steering the direction of that development. So when I think about the future of St. Louis, I hope to see more diversity and I definitely see more serious possibility for that there. For our last few minutes, I'd love to open it up to you all. Uh, if you have any questions for the panel, just raise your hand and we'll try and go around and answer as many questions as we can. Yeah. Uh, when you guys are working for an agency setting or for clients, how do you guys kind of wrangle with your personal ethics and the direction the client's going? For example, if they're from oil or from like marketing to the young toys, how do you wrangle with your need to create your obligation to the client and your own personal ethics. 
I mean, I guess I've only had one, which is, you know, controversial. Uh, it's Monsanto, and they probably built part of this library. Um, <laughs> but uh, I think when I did it, or when it, it sounds like a dirty thing. When I worked with them, it was uh, less of a thing of, you know, they hit me up on Twitter, which was interesting. The only client work I've ever gotten from Twitter. And my company's name is Anti-Agency. And I have a representative of one of, you know, the more controversial chemical firms in St. Louis, the only one. Along the way, you know, I kind of took my bias and set that aside and really listened to people that work there and tried to understand where they come from because it's, they employ a, a large group of people in this city. And some of it was funny, some of it they, they didn't realize that they were so hated uh, through a lot of culture and community. But in other respects, it was just people trying to do their job, do a good job, and trying to help as many people as they can with what they think that they're doing. So I think I learned a lot, and I put my emotional bias to the side. Uh, I made some money, and I was going to put that money into something that I thought could portray a, a level-headed look at the company, and then I just moved on with other things and forgot about it. But I think, you know, I think it's, um, you know, that's an interesting one because it's, it's not necessarily, it's very hard, or very uh, not normal that you get a client that is controversial, like big tobacco, or or gambling or things like that. And I think that you can learn a lot just by interfacing with them and then also knowing what you won't do, so. <clears throat> um, you know, I think it's always a balance because to pretend like anybody is, is, is pure is probably unfair and a little self-righteous. Um, I would say that my business partner and credit would not go to me. Um, she's much stronger at this than I am, is she has turned down quite a bit of money and work um, for ethical reasons. And it is tough. And there have been a few where I've argued with her about it because, <laughs> you know, if you, you are running a small business and it's tough to survive and you have people whose paychecks depend on you and your own paycheck depends on you. So it's, it's always a balance, but sometimes you do have to sacrifice and say, well, if, if we can't do it the right way and survive, then maybe we're just not going to survive. Um, but, you know, again, I just go back to the first thing I said, which is you can be, you can also sound too self-righteous if you, you know, who, who can we work with that is totally pure uh, and, and ourselves are we totally pure? That, that doesn't really exist. But I do think it's an important place where you should draw your own ethical boundaries and have reasons for them at the beginning. And then are you strong enough to stick with those? And I know that I have a lot of respect for my business partner because she, uh, Elizabeth, because she does have the strength to do that. And I don't know that I always would. As a creator, I would say sometimes you have to make those tough decisions. Um, but establishing and you know some sort of integrity has been important. You know, I started my blog talking about affordable style, but somewhere over the like nine years I've been running that's like I so I'm very kind of mindful about any collaborators that I accept. And for the most part, I think my work attracts the type of collaborators that would be a good fit. But every now and again I do have to turn down a great percentage of those. Like I was contacted by a company. This is just random that did some kind of like spray tan kind of lotion creams. And I mean, my first thought was, you do know I'm black, right? You don't even have a color like you use. So, I mean, I would say no to that, even though it would have been a really nice paycheck, but I had to maintain kind of the integrity of my work because people look for me because of the choices that I make. So I do make tough decisions sometimes in that regard. Anybody else? Kind of more of the back end part of what you guys do. I was. How do you all, um, I guess, it's really like trademarking work. What was your process of doing that so you could protect, you know, what you have now? Everybody did that as well, trademarking your work and protecting your work. 
um, in my business, uh, your work is always going to get ripped off, so uh, <laughs> deal with it, I guess. Uh, but you can get angry or you can be flattered, you know. I've, I've seen lots of my friends' work uh, ripped off. I, I don't know. The, the legality in fashion is, is really not there. I mean, you look at companies like Forever 21 and they're ripping off uh, runways as soon as they come off because they can't. So, um, in, in, in my world, you just have to toughen up and be better than them, I guess. Yeah, I would say when we uh, started our business, um, one of the th questions I had to ask myself was like, setting my pride aside and understanding what I didn't know. And when I started thinking about trademarking or copywriting or whatever the case might be, for me it was like getting over that hump, like, oh my gosh, I'm gonna pay a lawyer to you know, think about this stuff or a CPA to think about this stuff. But they're a professional for a reason and they helped me understand the roads that were worth going down and the roads that weren't worth going down. And like, you know, as Michael was saying, like, at the end of the day, there's going to be some people that don't have integrity with their work and they're going to maybe rip off either what you did or what your friend did or something like that. But um, there is definitely courses of action you can take initially to like at least learn and be cognizant of you know how to run your business the right way and, and also protect yourself to some degree. So. I think we have to wrap it up. If you have any more questions, though, my name is Rachel Graham. I'm with the Live Magazine, and I can definitely get those answered for you, so I'll hang out for a little while, while afterward. Thanks so much again to Tara and Mike and all of Design Week. Can we give our panelists a round of applause?